My name is John Lobel. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. I blog at creativitydiscourse.com, review movies from a mythological point of view at cinemadiscourse.com, and you can reach me at johnlobel at macmac.com. This is a brief discussion of technological futures and it's really a uh, an abbreviation of a possible uh, presentation that would be much longer, and or it could be two or three presentations. And the idea here is that there are a series of um, of technological developments, and we're amidst, in the midst of computation, information, biotech, um, nanotechnology, the singularity. And I want to just clearly explain what these things are so that as we're exposed to them, we can uh, become more familiar. We'll have a, an understanding of what's being presented to us. So I won't be able to fully develop that in this brief outline, but that would be the idea in a longer presentation. So it's fun to begin any talk about the future in technology with a quote from William Gibson. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And I want to start with a project called Timeship. And Timeship is a major resource, uh, I'm sorry, research uh, facility under development. And the purpose is extreme life extension. So it's going to be research laboratories and um, for people who do not live long enough to see the aging process in their DNA turned off. It'll have uh, cryopreservation facilities for patients uh, to preserve them until that they can be reanimated and that can be done at a future time. So the people involved with this project are optimistic that they will be able to stop the aging process eliminate death as we know it, and create a totally new approach to human life. So then the question comes, uh, is this possible? So let's look at some areas of technological development and start with computation. In a discussion of computation, uh, we can sort of push back. You know, when was the first computers? But modern computers are what's called universal Turing machines. And this is the notion of a computer developed by Alan Turing in 1936, uh, a device that manipulates symbols on a strip of tape according to a table of rules. And the notion here is that's interesting is that any Turing machine can simulate any other Turing machine. So uh, your laptop computer can do anything a supercomputer can do, except maybe a lot slower. Uh, and then it becomes interesting that is our world itself a computation? And if so, it can be simulated. So one way to understand computation is simulation. Uh, whether we're simulating a weather phenomena with formulas or we're simulating um, uh, images with uh, fractal computer graphics. And the thing we notice about computers is that they get more powerful. That's referred to as Moore's Law. We'll talk about that a couple of times. But it's just fun to uh, compare ENIAC, one of the first modern computers, completed in 1946, uh, a thousand times faster than its contemporaries, and it could do 5,000 operations per second. If we look at a cutting-edge computer today, a Cray XT5 Jaguar, it can do 2.3 petroflops per second. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I think I've written out the right number, uh, 23,000 thousand trillion operations per second. But who knows, when you get that many zeros, how you describe it in words. So they've gotten a lot faster, and they're just beginning. The um, today's computers are 
made possible by silicon chips so that what was done by uh, numerous vacuum tubes in the 40s and 50s is now done by transistors and those transistors are miniaturized and there are typically now around a billion transistors on a chip in our laptop computer. This is an early chip. We can actually count the number of transistors, so there's nowhere near a billion yet. But we can see how small it is on a fingertip. And here are some uh, chips that we have known, great chips. Upper left is the first transistor. Middle left is the 6502, which was in the Apple II computer, one of the first uh, uh, consumer desktop computers in the middle is a Motorola 68000. It was in the first Macintosh. And on the bottom left is a, um, a two dual core chips that would be in a laptop today. And on the right is a next generation four core chip. And they're going to be a lot more cores very quickly. But that's just the beginning. Um, a transistor, which is an off-on switch on a chip, is solid state and no moving parts. So the on and off states are achieved through electrical charge, but they're still pretty big, involving millions and millions of atoms to make one of these tiny off-on sw switch transistors. But um, here we see on the left uh, Quantum Silicon Inc. working on quantum dot computers where you force electrons into a tight space that changes their behavior. And on the right is one of Michelle Simmons. Uh, she works in Australia, a quantum computation with a single atom transistors. So she's working to make the on-off chip one single atom. And at that point, we'll get quantum behavior and talk about that in a moment. But... Uh, this is sort of thought of as the moment as the Holy Grail, the ultimate uh, uh, computational process. She only has one transistor here, <laughs> but in a quantum computer that can do a lot. But um, we eventually probably go beyond that. And then the off-on could be spins on single electrons, for example. So in quantum computing, the uh, imagine the off-on state is both off and on and can be in many states at one time, uh, making something far more powerful than what we understand as a computer today. So on the bottom left is Shor's algorithm, which established the possibility of quantum computing. On the upper left is a, uh, uh, a device that can do quantum computing right now, which is extremely rudimentary compared to what we hope it'll be. But the implication of it we can see here with um, uh, a formula developed by students or postdocs of Seth Lloyd. And this formula, which they have developed, can um, solve systems with a trillion equations and a trillion variables. So there's something called the uh, traveling salesman problem. If a, if a salesman has to hit 18 cities, um, what's the shortest route among all those cities? And with a year or so of computing, a computer could figure that out, but today's computers. If it's 23 cities, it would take 6,000 years of computing to figure out the shortest route. Quantum computer could do it in a couple of seconds. So that's the implication of what we're coming to. We're also concerned with the human interface. So this is the first Macintosh from Apple. And what we loved about it is uh, those of us that didn't want to work with a telephone book of, uh, of instructions for how to make it do things sitting next to it, uh, we could just go to the menu with the mouse and have it do it. And this is the basis of our computers to this day. And this has come to us uh, now as a uh, tablet computer, an Apple iPad, but this is obviously a very interim technology and there's much more to come. Our computing is now moving into the cloud. Let's go back and uh, look at something. We'll talk about it again later. But how powerful can this iPad be? 
how much uh, computational power can I stuff into this thing and have the battery last for 10 hours? And the answer is unlimited because it can link to uh, the cloud to banks of computers that do the work that we need. It doesn't have to do it itself. And another revolution is just coming upon us is to put sensors in things. So here we see on the lower left a penny with a couple of sensors. You can see how small these sensors are, They're called smart dust. And the idea here is, where are my keys? If I need to find something on my computer, I go to search. Why can't I use that to find the remote control for the TV or my keys or my glasses? And very shortly, you will. All of these things will have sensors built in them and uh, they will be intelligently interacted with their environment. Buildings in the futures will have hundreds of thousands of sensors dispersed throughout the building. If there's corrosion going on inside a wall, if some beam is rusting, uh, this will be reported to the maintenance department that will have this sort of integrated organic ongoing relationship with every aspect of the building for its ongoing maintenance. We already do that with airplanes, and we'll soon be doing it with everything. And uh, who knows what directions computers are going to go in? One possibility is DNA computers. Um, if you've got stuff on a disk, you worry that the magnetic material on that disk in 10, 20, 50 years could erode, degrade in its uh, storage capability. DNA, even though it's uh, organic, uh, a one-time living material, is reliable for hundreds of thousands of years of storing stuff. So there's a possible direction for our future computers. And then the human computer interface. At what point will this stuff be buried uh, into uh, directly into our brain? As of this recording, it was in the New York Times and uh, just uh, a day ago, uh, the release of a um, embedded chip into the retina so that blind people can see again. And there's lots of caveats here. It has to be someone who became blind. It doesn't work if you're born blind because uh, the brain has to be set up for seeing. But you know, approaches for people who are born blind will be developed eventually as well. And then the whole issue of artificial intelligence, as these machines can do more and more. <clears throat> A whole discussion in itself. Next, information and networking. Sort of related to our discussion on computers. Any discussion of information begins with uh, Claude Shannon's information theory from the um, late 40s, and he developed the elements of transmission of information from a source uh, through a signal to a destination. He was working with the issue of how much information can you get through, he worked at AT&T at Bell Labs, how much information can you get through two copper wires? And one of the realizations was that it the information is independent of its content. In other words, well, some information is useful and some is junk. Well, the telephone wires don't care uh, whether you're putting through gibberish or Shakespeare. Um, and the issue came down to how many ones and zeros you could transmit. Uh, and he coined the term bits in this paper. He had done something in his master's thesis uh, which is to realize that you could use relays off on switches to emulate uh, logic processes, if this, then that. And um, that's the basis of all computers. And then his information theory is now the basis of we're redoing physics, chemistry, biology, psychology through information theory, not to mention everything we do with computers and networking. So, uh, not well known, but pretty important guy. The uh, other issue that we're dealing with in information channels is the amount of capacity they have. 
our upper left is showing a street scene strung with wires, our right, uh, an African with a cell phone. And one of the things we like to say is, well, yes, all this uh, computational power is available, but only to rich first world people. Not true. Half of all Africans have cell phones. And uh, the, 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 we like to say that an African boy today with a smartphone, they don't all have smartphones, but one with a smartphone has access to more information than the President of the United States had access to just 25 years ago. So we're in the midst of a revolution here. And here on the right, on the top, is a conventional old-fashioned telephone with a twisted pair of wire, had a um, capacity of um, 60,000 bits per second, the amount of information you could get through there. On the bottom, it says hypothetical laser system. Uh, this chart was done before we had uh, uh, laser fiber optics coming into our apartments for our TV and internet. It says 100 billion, but um, on the left, we see on the bottom, laser fibers are currently at 20 billion bits per second and 1 trillion bits per second experimentally. So that is still uh, growing rapidly. And our work world is being enveloped in uh, all kinds of networks that are cho totally changing our relationships to space, to time, and to each other as human beings. And uh, these relationships are being uh, very much transformed by social networking, Twitter, Skype, BitTorrent, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Wikipedia. And some of these things we can be critical of, think of them as teenagers wasting time, but in the long run, they're going to change everything. And then finally, search. Uh, we're all delighted at what we can find on Google, but search is in its infancy. Uh, one of Google's competitors is Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha, and it uh, searches computationally with intelligence so that it can actually figure, not just look for uh, bit chunks of information, but relate the information and manipulate it before presenting it to you. And so even though we may still live in towns that look like, like what they did uh, 50 years ago, there is this layer of uh, networking being placed over them that is changing our lives. Biotech and DNA. We like to say, oh, there was the, steel, the Iron Age, you know, the, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, uh, and now, what is it? The Information Age, the Biotech Age. Quite some years ago in the 80s, Alvin Toffler wrote a book that he called uh, The Third Wave precisely because he didn't want to pick one. He said they're all happening. So here uh, are Watson and Crick, 1953, decoding the molecular structure of DNA uh, using X-ray data collected by Rosalind Franklin. And... So we have two backbones of uh, sugar phosphates, and then linked to them are base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and two rules. Adenine and thymine can link, guanine and cytosine can link, and there you go. Four base, four base pairs or letters of an alphabet, and the words in those alphabets are four letters long, and two rules, and you get DNA. Now we add a couple more steps. Um, DNA makes RNA, RNA directs, directs the making of proteins, and so four letters, two rules, a couple more steps, and you get all of life. Now one of the things this tells us, of course it's a lot more complicated than that, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting how in certain ways how simple it is, the very simple rules can make very complex things, and we'll see that in a minute. So what can you do with this? Well, um, um, you can restructure the DNA. Uh, 
and you can uh, move genes around. So uh, below left is uh, a spider goat. Spider silk is very strong, stronger than steel for its weight, but it's kind of hard to extract it from spiders. We have not yet successfully synthesized it yet. You know, we, we, um, we've been able to sort of emulate silk with nylon, but there's still things, you know, we, that, that biology can do that we can't do. So you take the DNA in the spider that makes those proteins, put them uh, in a goat. The goat makes the protein uh, in its milk. You extract the protein from its milk and you build cables with spider silk. So that's something that's being done now. Uh, Craig Ventner, uh, who sort of, uh, should we say, beat the government in the race to sequence human DNA, has his a company now that makes various biological um, built to specification life. And so, for example, he's creating customized algae to make uh, substitutes for oil, things like that. So we're beginning to be able to do that. And sequencing DNA, detecting what those A, C, G, uh, et cetera, letters are in the alphabet um, was a hugely involved process. We'll look at it uh, a moment from now. But very rapidly, we're developing techniques, for example, stripping apart the two DNA strips, pulling them through a detector, and it simply reads out the letters. So uh, this is being done right now. We're encountering new materials and the possibility of uh, nanotechnology changing the way we do everything. So new materials, plastics, they've been around for a while, but you sort of forget how incredible this stuff is, how we can make it to exactly what we need it for. The latest um, Macintosh laptops use aluminum, but slightly older ones have plastic cases. The uh, plastic garbage bags and how capable they are and how strong they are. and now, plastic airplanes, so the Boeing 787 uh, made with plastic and um, um, much lighter and more corrosion resistant than aluminum. In nanotechnology, the hope is someday you'll have a little uh, uh, fabricating machine in which you can uh, feed into it feedstocks, mostly carbon, but maybe hydrogen, a few other um, chemicals other elements and start making things. So uh, below that machine on the left is an assembler. Uh, all those little spheres are atoms. In the upper right are some uh, uh, gears interacting with each other made of atoms. And then on the lower right is an imagined little <coughs> medical robot. They would swim through the body and treat um, treat uh, red blood cells here. We're getting there with materials like graphene upper left. Each of the dots up there is a carbon atom in sheets one atom thick. We've had buckyballs which are spheres of carbon atoms, carbon nanotubes which are tubes of carbon atoms, but uh, these graphene sheets are probably going to be extremely important in future technologies such as um, uh, single atom processes in computation. Here they are sandwiched in the upper right between silicon. Quantum dots. Here we stuff uh, electrons into confined spaces so that they can't do things that they would want to do and as a result they we get um, well designer atoms. We get a behavior on the part of the uh, of electron that is not found naturally in nature and can produce things that we want. For example, here, uh, getting these colors and suggesting future ways of making flat screens. Now, an idea of generative genomics. So let's ask a question. If you wanted to make an oak tree, would you 
take a telephone pole, nail sticks to it, and glue leaves to the sticks? No. Well, what would you do? You'd put some rules in the ground, the DNA in an acorn, and let the oak tree make itself. Why aren't we making our cell phones that way? We can make human beings that way. We can make oak trees that way. So the suggestion here is that there's a very powerful new way of fabricating things available to us. So these technologies that we've been looking at uh, could start to imply totally new ways of making things, new ways that we relate to nature. Now, 1953, same time that Watson and Crick on the upper left were decoding DNA, Jenny von Neumann, a, uh, one of the most brilliant scientists of the 20th century at Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies, was asking Stanislaw Ohm, a brilliant mathematician, um, how might we go about making a machine that could reproduce itself? And Ohm suggested cellular automata. And that is, uh, imagine a... A grid and rules to determine when squares in the grid would be activated or not activated. John Conway, British mathematician, picked up on that uh, that idea, created something called Game of Life. And if we looked at an animated version of this um, on the lower right, those little blue things going off to the lower right are being generated by rule set affecting the ones on top of that grid so that we can make, manufacture things um, with these rules. Stephen Wolfram, a brilliant visual mathematician, creator of Mathematica, a high power sort of graphing calculator that uh, scientists and mathematicians use, likes to say, I think that when I find the code that generates our universe, it will be just six lines. So in his book, A New Kind of Science, he shows how the processes of nature are rule-generated like the processes in software and not formula-generated as Newton had described. So Newton's formulas work well for describing the orbits of planets, but they don't describe how a tree grows. They don't describe a cloud. And for a long time, we said, well, clouds are spheres, knowing they're not. Tree trunks are cylinders, knowing they're not, because that's the mathematical tool we had. But now, with these uh, cellular automata, rule-based systems, we can understand and describe nature in totally new ways. And with these simple rule-based systems, we get, for example, uh, fractals. So Benoit Mandelbrot, a uh, brilliant, again, visual mathematician, just died recently, developed fractals, which is a, a geometric form of self-similarity at any scale, so that the large branches in a tree have a similar pattern to the smaller branches, have a similar pattern to the twigs, have a similar pattern to the veins in the leaf, etc., or a seacoast. Uh, as you zoom in, the patterns are the same. Or a cloud, as you zoom in, the patterns are the same. And this has proved so powerful in describing nature <clears throat> that it's used in, um, in uh, computer animation in movies so that when there's a mountain range and the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the warriors in Lord of the Rings are streaming through mountains, those mountains can be generated by computers and look totally convincing because the rules we use to generate them fractally are the same rules nature is using. So um, here is what's called a Mandelbrot set, which is a particular kind of fractal, and we can zoom in on it. And as we zoom in, we see self-similar patterns and we see that we can zoom in literally, infinitely, and it's continually there. And this formula, um, a recursive quadratic equation, 
very simple formula, can generate <coughs> uh, that infinitely complex Mandelbrot set. Now let's go back to Wolfram's statement that he thinks he can generate the world, the universe, from six lines of code. <clears throat> Hasn't found it yet, but he's looking. There's uh, millions of lines of code in Microsoft Windows. But Microsoft Windows is in the world. So that uh, Wolfram six lines of code would generate the world that would include everything in the world, including the millions of lines of code in Microsoft Windows. And you can make three-dimensional Mandelbrot sets. Now, this is still in the computer, so how do you get it out? So, uh, Neil Gershenfeld is a professor at MIT. <clears throat> He's the head of the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms and has developed the MIT Fab Lab. And he has a, um, a setup about the size Oh, maybe three desks, and it can make just about anything. You can take it to Africa, and you need a pump for a part for a water pump. So on the right, it's the lower left. There is a part for a water pump. You need a cell phone. You need a bicycle. Well, you need a bicycle. You got to make a factory to make the bicycle parts. Um, why don't you just make the bicycle? And so, um, Gershenfeld's Fab Lab. Uh, can make all these things. Now, I can't make a computer chip, so the way it would make a cell phone is chips would be a sort of universally programmable chips would be part of the feedstock in the uh, in the Fab Lab. So, one way to think of what Gershenfeld is doing <laughs> is it's a huge 3D printer. So, on the left, we have a simple 3D printer. You can buy these for under $1,000. And you see that blue, um, I'm sorry, green square in there against uh, a, a line, a surface. Well, that's the print head. It's going back and forth, just like the print head in your 2D printer on your desktop. And each time it goes back and forth, it lays down a thousandth of an inch of plastic that it has melted and quickly it quickly cools. And after it's done that a thousand times, you get one inch of a thing. And so uh, below that on the right is some fancy gear thing uh, that it made. These things would be a real headache to make any other way. And then it's, they're all made out of plastic. And so on the lower left looks like a spool of uh, fishing line. Uh, that's the plastic. You see that on the top in that white loop feeding into it. So that's the feedstock feeding in to this uh, 3D printing machine make stuff in plastic, but if you want to pay a, a good fraction of a million dollars, one on the right can do it in stainless steel. And, by, and BMW has warehouses full of these 3D printers uh, printing out parts for their automobiles in, uh, in stainless steel. And uh, these are parts that there's just no way you'd make with, uh, you know, uh, castings and welding and filing uh, uh, due to their complexity. And uh, principles of letting the thing make itself, self-assembly. IBM has developed techniques for self-assembly for making uh, new generation computer chips. And this is a book by two important people in the field, uh, Robert Freitas and Ralph Merkel, Kinematic Self-Replicating Machines. And it sort of describes the history and possible future of machines that can make anything, including themselves, self-replicating. Uh, some people working in these uh, generative genomic principles in architecture, uh, one of my colleagues at Pratt Institute, Haresh Salvani, he spins out his universes in the computer in uh, 27 or more dimensions and, and, and can morph any figure from one to another in what he calls the morphological universe. And on the lower left are some um, uh, forms that he's made with these techniques, working with a uh, uh, company called uh, Milgo Bufkin that uh, fabricates using these principles. And this family, uh, just like this, are in the 
New York permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is Carl Shu, also a colleague of mine at Pratt Institute, gives his students three genes at the beginning of the semester, and by the end of the semester, the world, the um, the building has made itself. And uh, Carl spin uh, cellular automata worlds uh, around spheres, for example. And uh, one of my websites, generativegenomics.com, describes uh, this whole concept. So, when might all of this happen? Uh, when's, when, 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 when are we going to have this little uh, bread box in our apartment that you can uh, program a uh, diamond engagement ring, go out to dinner, and come back, open it up, and it's made one for you? So we have a concept that's called the singularity, and um, it's currently strongly promoted by a futurist named Ray Kurzweil, and he refers to the law of accelerating returns. So his description of the fact that change is accelerating is described in his book, The Singularity is Near. And so, start with the question, what will things be like 100 years from now? And he said, well, let's see. Let's just look at very round numbers and say it's the year 2000. What was it like in the year 1900? And, oh, very quickly, we, we got automobiles and we got airplanes. And uh, we got, by the mid to the century, we had computers. So, in the next 100 years, and Kershaw says, wrong what will happen in the next hundred years will not be like what happened in the last hundred years. It'll be more like what happened in the last 20,000 years because the rate of change is accelerating. So on the left is a hockey stick graph of exponential growth. And um, we associate exponential growth most uh, clearly with what's called Moore's Law from Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore, who in 1965 observed, it's not a law of nature, it's an observation, that the, uh, shall we say, the number of transistors on a chip doubles every two years. Now, um, it's for um, quite some time that has held true. And so from the mid 20th century to now, we've been right on track. And then Kurzweil says, you know, it's, it's not just a chip, it's electronics in general, so that we can go back to 1900, starting with relays, and seeing it's been going on for 100 years. And the chart is right on. You know, the, each generation of chip falls right where it should on the line. So everything that's based on electronics, which includes uh, memory, hard disk, digital cameras, medical devices are all subject to the doublings of Moore's law. Now, uh, let's think about what this means, this exponential growth. So there's a fun little story of a craftsman who makes a chess set, a chess board uh, with inlaid with semi-precious stones and gives it to a Raja who says, this is beautiful, you can have anything you want. And of course, our craftsman's smart enough not to ask the, the Raja's daughter's hand in marriage. So he says, well, uh, just give me one grain of rice to put on the first square of the chessboard, two for the second, four for the third, eight, etc. The Raja says, what are we talking about here? A bag of rice? You got it. Well, little problem. By a 21st square, there's a million um, uh, grains by the 41st square, there's over a trillion grains of rice. Uh, and by the uh, 64th square, we have 2 to the 63rd grains of rice, which is quite a bit. And so if we add them all up, we get a number that's too big to uh, even uh, say. But let's just say it's a thousand times the global production of yearly production of rice trying to fit on that chessboard. So... Exponential growth can be very powerful. And it's not just... In so, 
does this apply beyond the world of electronics? And, well, if it's in any way involved with... Um, so, does this apply beyond computer chips? If it's any way involved with electronics, yes. So let's look at an example. Sequencing the human genome. 1984, uh, U.S. Department of Energy project set out to do it, budgeting it at $10 billion. And after they'd been working on it for some years, Craig Venter came along and said, I'm going to do it with private funding for $300 million. Uh, and did. In 2007, James Watson's DNA was sequenced for a million dollars. As of 2011, there's a company called Illumina is doing it for $5,000. Uh, it's much less as of today. And soon uh, there are proposals to do it for as little as $30. So you might stop in your local drugstore and get it done while you wait. A big come down from 10 billion. Now think of how many areas of technology, medicine, healthcare, uh, that can start to be affected by this. So here's a chart showing our exponential growth, and hmm. Um, how many calculations can you do per second for $1,000? And where we are in the year 2000, and we project that by the year 2020, we will be at the capability of a human brain on a chip. And by uh, maybe 2050, that one chip will be be able to match in calculations per second all the brains of all the human beings who have ever lived. So um, we're not too far along, but when you get on that hockey stick, it can really start to move. And we're moving, <coughs> excuse me, from mechanical world, you see on the left, to our, uh, from the macrocosm on the left to the microcosm on the right. Here we are. Uh, an IBM project to start manipulating one atom at a time for a next generation of hard drives uh, of, of storage that will be a thousand times denser than uh, today's hard drives and flash memories. And then this all comes to us in... Um, our iPad, which once again, by being linked to the entire cloud, uh, has brings us capabilities far beyond that of the chip inside that device. So let's just wrap up with a thought. And the thought is, um, what is going to be our experience of change due to these technologies. And will that experience be, will we experience greater change than did previous generations? So I like this uh, slide. Uh, I like to wrap up various talks with it. On the left, we see 1893, the Winslow House by Frank Lloyd Wright, the first house that he designed on his own after leaving the office of Louis Sullivan. And you'll see to the left, coming off the house, is an archway. There's a driveway that goes through that arch. So on the left, on the um, bottom left, we're looking through that arch. In the back is the stables, because you're coming in with your horse, uh, either on horseback or in, with a carriage. And then look on the lower right of that lower left image, and you see a little black cast iron Scotty dog on the stoop uh, going into the mud room of the house. And that's where you would scrape the mud off your boots. So that's the level of technology in Frank Lloyd Wright's first building on his own. To the right is one of his last projects in the late 1950s. 
It's a project for a mile high skyscraper that was designed to have atomic powered elevators. So Frank Lloyd Wright died in 1959. There were satellites, there were computers, there was atomic energy. Um, and so look at the change that Frank Lloyd Wright went through in the course of his life and then think about the change that we have and will go through in the course of our lives and interesting to think about these comparisons. Thank you.